On Monday, October 20th, a large percentage of the internet went down due to an outage that stemmed from DynamoDB. Today, in this video, we're going to be analyzing the outage that happened in US East 1 between Sunday, October 19th, lasting well into Monday, October 20th, 2025. Hi, if you're new around here, my name is Ryan. I'm an AWS Certified Solutions Architect and Developer, and my goal is to teach you modern cloud system design using AWS. Let's jump in. As you well know by this point, DynamoDB was the first system that was affected, so let's break down the root cause. DynamoDB uses a system that automatically updates DNS records in Route 53. This is what lets customers and other AWS services find the endpoint for the service. In this case, it was dynamodb.useast1.amazonaws.com. This system is comprised of two major parts. The first is the DNS planner. This creates a list of load balancers which should be active for DynamoDB within a given region. The second part is the DNS inactive. This is a separate service that picks up plans made by the planner and then updates the records in Route 53. When an enactor applies an update, it has to ensure three things. First is that all records must update together to ensure that there is no partial or mixed state. Second, it has to ensure that only one version of a plan can be active at any time. Third, it has to ensure that no other enactor can overwrite it mid-update. This means that plans are meant to be applied to Route 53 atomically, or in other words, in an all-or-nothing fashion. The enactors run in three different availability zones per region, in which all three enactors will attempt to update the DNS records with the fastest one winning. If one enactor in one availability zone fails to update the records, then another one will pick it up and they will keep trying until one of them succeeds. The one that succeeds then goes through a cleanup process, also called garbage collection, in which it removes all of the stale records left over from the previously implemented plan. The DNS planner enactor process happens in five stages. One, a planner creates a new plan with the DNS records pointing to the correct load balancers. Two, the enactor picks up the new plan. It checks to make sure, is this plan newer than the last one I successfully applied? Three, the enactor applies the DNS records to Route 53 in an all or nothing way. Four, concurrent updates between enactors are handled via conditional checks to ensure there isn't a conflict. Five, once an enactor applies its plan, it then initiates a garbage collection process where it deletes stale leftover records left in Route 53. Now, under normal circumstances, this is what happens every time. This multi-availability zone setup gives the enactor a high level of resiliency. But now let's talk about what went wrong. For the sake of this breakdown, let's simplify what happened. We have enactor one applying plan A and enactor two applying plan B. Enactor one first picks up plan A from the planner and confirms that it's the most current plan. Enactor one then attempts to write plan A to route 53, but it gets delayed. The reason AWS gave for this is that there was unusually high delays leading the enactor to have to retry its update on several of the DNS endpoints. Meanwhile, while this delay is happening, enactor two picks up plan B from the planner. Enactor 2 is then successfully able to write plan B to route 53. Up until this point, everything is fine and is working as intended. However, what happened next then changed everything. Right after Enactor 2 wrote plan B successfully to route 53, but before it began its garbage collection process, Enactor 1 was then able to successfully write its plan A to route 53. This happened because Enactor 1 had done its check to ensure that plan A was the most current plan hours before it actually succeeded in its write of those records to Route 53. This means that Enactor 1 was convinced that it still had the most current plan when it wrote its records. This successful write of Plan A by Enactor 1 overwrote Plan B that had just been written by Enactor 2. Now, this all happened in a fraction of a second because then Enactor 2 began its garbage collection process. It sees the records from Plan A, knows that they're stale, and then completely erases the records from Plan A that that Enactor 1 had just written. Route 53 is now left with empty DNS records. This then caused the planner enactor system to fail because it was unable to verify the state of the plan that was currently enacted in Route 53. This meant there had to be manual intervention to recreate the records and restore service. This rare confluence of events exposed a latent concurrency bug called a race condition. A race condition happens when two independent processes, one, both think that they can perform an action, two, race to do it first, 
Three, the final outcome then changes based on who wins that race, and there is no lock in place to prevent the wrong ordering. It is a timing dependent bug where the code works most of the time, in this case probably over 99%, but it fails under a rare sequence of events. While on the surface it was a DNS problem that caused DynamoDB to become unavailable, the root cause was actually a race condition that led to the DNS problems. This DNS issue also affected other downstream systems that relied on DynamoDB. If you're finding value in this, please don't forget to like the video and then please let me know down in the comments how this outage affected you. This DynamoDB outage affected multiple services, including EC2, Network Manager, Network Load Balancer, Lambda, SQS, and IAM. This list doesn't seem long given that AWS has over 200 service offerings, but these are some of the most used services in AWS. EC2 was unable to launch new instances. This is because the internal system for managing capacity on host machines, which is called the Droplet Workflow Manager, was unable to fetch capacity data which is stored in DynamoDB. This meant that the Droplet Workflow Manager assumed that there was no capacity and would not launch new instances. Once communication with DynamoDB was restored, EC2 had a massive backlog of instances, which led to AWS having to throttle those requests so that the Droplet Workflow Manager could catch up. Network Manager and Network Load Balancer were affected because EC2's recovery led to a delay in network state propagation. This meant that Network Load Balancer's health checks were returning unhealthy for these instances, and so they would stop routing traffic to them. In some cases, this caused a complete failover into another availability zone, which was of course going through the exact same thing in that region and would just propagate this vicious cycle. Lambda relies on DynamoDB for its internal orchestration and EC2 and Network Load Balancer for its compute and routing. This meant that function creation and updates failed and event source polling stalled, especially from SQS and Kinesis. This led AWS to have to throttle function invocations in order to preserve capacity. Now SQS itself wasn't directly broken, but because of the issues with Lambda, then messages began to start piling up in SQS. And with IAM, both simple token service API calls and Identity Center failed because they both rely on DynamoDB for session and state information, which led to temporary auth failures. Now, while this outage only occurred in US East 1, it just so happens to be the largest, most used, and most important region in all of AWS. And since AWS is the largest cloud computing provider, accounting for 30% of the global cloud market share, this makes US East 1 the largest regional cloud computing entity on the planet. This is why a significant significant portion of the internet went down during this outage. Needless to say, this was a catastrophic event with a huge blast radius. If you are into system design, this is a case study in race conditions which can be very difficult to suss out. They can sometimes be latent in software systems for months or even years because they require an extremely uncommon convergence of events. This can lull you into a false sense of security because you may never actually experience the problem and thus will not be equipped to handle the situation when it happens. This is probably part Part of the reason why it took AWS almost an hour to pinpoint the DNS issue, and then another two hours before the DNS issue was fully resolved. Let's talk about what came about after all of this. Well first, AWS stock actually went up a couple percent between Monday evening and Tuesday. Second, the memes were dank. I had to physically remove myself from the room with my computer because I could not stop scrolling on LinkedIn looking at them. And third, everyone and their mother took to LinkedIn and X claiming that this is the reason to go multi-cloud, or to go to a different cloud provider, or to leave the cloud and entirely. And honestly, each of these perspectives is understandable after such a catastrophe. But I think that Forrest Brazil had the best take on this on his blog, Good Tech Things. It's titled, When Everyone is Down, No One Is. I will link his Substack post about it down in the description, and you should definitely go and read it. And while Forrest's take is sardonic, I think that he highlights some important points about this outage and how the cloud works in the modern era. His main point is that there really is no such thing as 100% resiliency to a situation like this, no matter what you do. Even if you're not in US East 1, or even in AWS at all, this outage will probably affect you in some way, regardless of your architecture. A downstream system you depend on will go down, or one of your partners will go down, or one of your customers will go down. When an incident like this happens, it's so widespread that he calls it an act of God, and it really does feel that way. While I know that his take is intentionally hyperbolic, I think it's worth saying that regional and architectural isolation, as well as loosely coupled systems, are realistic strategies. While they don't make you completely immune to situations like this, they can go a long way towards mitigating it. No system will ever be 100% resilient, but I don't think that's a good reason to not try. 
And while AWS has detailed implementation plans and safeguards to prevent this from happening in the future, the situation does serve as a wake-up call for us to realize just how dependent the internet and we as an extension have become on AWS. So what do you guys think? How are you affected by this outage? I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on this, so let me know down in the comments. And one last thing, I will be at reInvent this year, so if you see me, please come and say hi. Please don't forget to like the video, and thank you for watching.